Hi, everyone. Good morning. I think that uh, the numbers are still coming in, but uh, we have more and more participants. But uh, for the interest of time, let's start. So first of all, welcome to our Back to Basics training. Um, as mentioned on this slide, this training session will be recorded. Um, we will endeavor to try to respond to your questions in the chat as much as possible. But in view of the mere number of people in this call, um, we will not be able to answer to all of them. So if you have any questions, um, do not hesitate to email us afterwards. Our email addresses will be shown afterwards at the end on the last slide. The slide as well will be available. And uh, with that, maybe I would briefly introduce ourselves. So today's presenters are Mirella that you see here, Pablo and myself. And we're part of the MedTech Europe Legal, legal and Compliance Department. And for those of you who don't know who we are as MedTech Europe, MedTech Europe is the European Trade Association representing the medical technology industry. And a trade association is a group of companies here in the MedTech uh, industry. And we work together on key topics that are common to the entire industry, such as, for example, MDR and IVDR. And um, the association together with its member associations, as well as with the member uh, companies, we try to solve common problems uh, that different people here in the room uh, face, but we also make sure that we follow the same rules. In terms of common rules, uh, there is one set that uh, was agreed quite a while ago, and that's the rules of the game when the companies in the medtech field are interacting with healthcare professionals and healthcare organizations. And these rules are outlined in the medtech Europe code. And we're here today to actually not only remind you what these rules are, but really help you to understand uh, why they matter. Probably if you want, you can go to the next slide. Um, so that's the agenda for today. Um, I will be walking you through the two first points, so compliance basics and legal framework. Then Mirella is going to start with the overarching principles that are underlying the code uh, and as well as the scope before Pablo will dive into the, the nitty gritty rules of the code. I will then say a few words about roles and responsibilities of the different stakeholders involved. Um, what we wanted to, to show you is a sort of a blast from the past and take you down uh, memory lane to remind you of a video that we developed in 2015 uh, before the, 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 the big change was approved. So with that, maybe Pablo, you can show a video. And it's a video that lasts a little bit over four minutes and then we'll take um, we'll take the rest of the training just after the video. Medical technologies, they are all around us. There is no doubt that medtech is extremely valuable to human life. Mark Cornell lost his eyesight 20 years ago after serving in the U.S. Air Force for 18 years. Today, he can see some of his friends for the first time. You're, you're pretty. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow, I'm tearing up. <laughs>
Guten Tag. How have your experiences been with our product? Very good. And thanks for sponsoring me to attend the annual Global Health Conference next month. Oh, happy to do so. But don't think that I am trying to influence your medical judgment, huh? Of course not. My independent medical judgment is not for sale. Great! By the way, my colleagues have also booked you the business class ticket to Las Vegas that you requested and placed you in a nice hotel close to the conference venue. And don't hesitate to bill us your expenses, too. Thanks. Appreciate that. And I insist to receive nothing in return. Industry financially supporting healthcare professionals to attend medical conferences, also known as direct sponsorship, was considered normal practice as part of medical education a few years ago. But when now comparing the countries that allow direct sponsorship, to the countries that have banned direct sponsorship, restricted direct sponsorship, or are debating the issue, it becomes clear that today's world has changed and countries are taking action. The medtech industry is committed to remaining 100% responsible for training healthcare professionals on how to use its devices and diagnostics. But is industry also responsible for financially supporting the medical education of healthcare professionals, which includes direct sponsorship? If so, how should this support be organized in the most appropriate way and in line with industry's values? In Europe, the leadership of EDMA and Ucomed have recommended to its members to Rethink industry support models for medical education of healthcare professionals. Phase out direct sponsoring of healthcare professionals to medical conferences as of the 1st of January 2018. And define, secure and frame educational grants in order to prevent abuse. On the 2nd of December 2015, when all EDMA and UCOMED members voted their annual General Assembly, we will know what position the medtech industry in Europe has taken. Follow the topic on medtecheurope.org and medtechviews.eu. So now let's dive into the actual training. So uh, I'd actually be interested to hear what you, what you think about this video that is actually eight years old, but that sort of like underlines what are the principles. And um, that's also why we're here today. We thought that this training is an opportunity for everyone around the table to collectively enhance our knowledge and ensure that we all on the same page with regards to our ethical and legal obligations. Um, the aim here is really to keep up to date with the, the rules, but also reducing the risk of violation and prevent compliance breaches that can, at the end of the day, harm both individual companies, but the entire industry's reputation uh, at the same time. And so we firmly believe that providing ongoing training and working together is actually the only way to um, actually grow as a responsible industry. And I also want to emphasize that the point here is really not finger pointing to actual problems, but to strengthen industry's commitment to compliance and the ethical code. Um, and sorry. Uh, and what I wanted to, to, if you can go to the, to the next two slides, in fact. So in terms of compliance basics, uh, you know, when the video was saying that the, in this, that the world is watching and that the industry is under scrutiny, you may remember that, uh, I mean, there's a number of, of news articles, but what sort of woke up a number of our colleagues was the ICIJ uh, inquiry into medtech, which took place in 2018. And in case you don't know what it is, the ICIJ is actually a global network of investigative journalists in more than 100 countries that collaborated in 2018 to really go 
in depth zooming into the medtech industry and trying to attack it by different angles one of them was really our relationship with healthcare professionals so that's just you know the background against which uh when we say that the world is watching and that industry's reputation is at risk the risk is actually really there probably we can go to the next slide um and uh, even though we are on this scrutiny, I think it's important to say that the collaboration between medtech industry and healthcare professionals is, however, really essential to develop, test, and implement innovative solutions that, at the end of the day, um, enhance patient care, but also improve healthcare workflows and drive advances and innovation. And so it's really by having industry and healthcare professionals working together that we can achieve this. And so it is about um, how do we frame this relationship so that when we are in the scrutiny, we actually know what to apply and uh, how to, to, to work together. And with that, um, Mirella, a little bit up to you. Uh, oh yeah, sorry. No, indeed, there was one more slide um, that, that was for me. So there was the indeed the, the rationale for the compliance world, but then it's true that there's also many, many different legal obligations that came in on top of uh, things and things have accelerated for the last 20 years. The legislation, both horizontal legislation that was very generic at the end, and then some very specific rules came into place that were really looking at, for example, transparency or sunshine obligations. So the, it's the, the reality is that today we are in a complex legal environment with many different rules are applying. Um, I saw that in the chat there was a question about do we as a company have to comply also with national codes when the when the national uh, when we're not a member of a national association? The reality is that um, the codes are based on all those different legal requirements and they try to interpret them in order to make sure that the rules are clear. So practically speaking, if you, for example, not a member, of the German association, uh, you don't have an obligation to comply with the national code of ethics of that association. But do not forget that that code is actually based on legal requirement, or if it's not legal requirement, what, uh, what judges would hold you accountable. Uh, and you know, codes are that, that standard that uh, often in many countries uh, would be looked at when deciding on a specific case. So the answer is formally, no, you don't have to, to, to comply with a local national code in a, in a national, from a national association you're not a member of, but be aware that actually you may actually want to comply with them. So now, Mirella, that's, <laughs> it, it's your turn to go, to go a little bit more in detail. Actually, sorry, probably to the previous slide, um, we'll talk about what is a code of contact. A uh, code of contact is fundamental to a successful compliance program because it articulates the organization's commitment to ethical behavior. The code should function in the same way as a constitution, meaning as a document that details the fundamental principles, values, and framework for action within the organization. Respectively, our code outlines the principles and culture for the entire medtech industry. Hence, all relevant operating policies of individual member companies should be derivative of these principles. As such, codes are of real benefit only if meaningfully communicated and accepted throughout the organization or industry they were developed for. The Medtech Europe code specifically governs the interactions that companies have with healthcare professionals and organizations particularly in the above mentioned areas of anti-bribery and anti-corruption. The code sets the minimum standards appropriate to the various types of activities carried out by the members and is not intended to supplant or supersede national laws, regulations, or professional codes. By establishing a code of contact, the industry as a whole demonstrates its commitment to ethical behavior. This integrity not only benefits patients and healthcare professionals, but also fosters confidence in the industry's ability to self-regulate. Um, 
Now we're coming to the next slide. And now let's take a closer look at the Meta Europe code. When does the code apply? Who is bound by the rules? And what are the five fundamental principles included in the code? When we refer to the scope of the code, we talk about the specific boundaries or the extent to which the code applies. Essentially, it defines what falls within and outside the purview of the code. By recalling the scope, we manage to have better clarity and consistency in terms of compliance with the code. The Meta Europe code, in particular, applies to the member companies of Meta Europe that are manufacturers of medical technologies. As provided by the statutes of Meta Europe, member companies must comply with the code as a minimum standard when they interact with healthcare professionals and healthcare organizations registered and practicing in the Meta Euro geographic area, irrespective of where the activity takes place and or when activities take place in the Meta Euro geographic area, irrespective of where the healthcare professionals and healthcare organizations are registered and practicing. Um, sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Um, next slide, and equally important to the scope are also the definitions that you can find within the code. More specifically, the Meta Europe code contains a very detailed list of definitions under its third part. Here, we would like to remind you two very important definitions that are essential for better complying with the code. First, we have the healthcare professional who is defined as any individual that in the course of their professional activities may directly, directly purchase, lease, recommend, or who may prescribe medical technologies or related services. And similarly, we define healthcare organization as any legal entity or body that is a healthcare, medical, or scientific association or organization which may have a direct or indirect influence on the prescription, recommendation, purchase, order of medical technologies and related services. Um, moving forward, uh, when we refer to the applicability of the code, we shall not forget to mention the geographic area where these rules apply. In our case, this area is named by the code as Meta Europe Geographic Area. And as you can see in the next two slides, it covers all the countries in the European Economic Area and the, and the countries where the member national associations are located. For example, in the next slide, uh, you can see uh, the Mecomet Geographic Area, which covers countries in the Middle East and Africa. MECOMED is a member national association of METEC Europe, therefore the code applies to these regions. Aline already explained how important the interaction between members and healthcare, healthcare professionals and organizations is in achieving METEC Europe's mission to make safe, innovative and reliable technology and related services available to, met, to more people. In each such interaction, member companies must continue to respect the obligation of healthcare professionals and organizations to make independent decisions about treatment and to safeguard the environment in which the interaction takes place in order to ensure the integrity of the industry. This is the spirit that the five basic principles contained in the code attempt to embody. The first principle underlines the importance of maintaining a positive image and perception of the medtech industry. Secondly, transparency is a cornerstone of ethical interactions. The principle of equivalence ensures that the remuneration is fair, equitable, and commensurate with the nature of the services provided. The fourth principle is separation, meaning that interactions between industry and healthcare professionals should not, be, should not be used to exert undue or improper influence over purchasing decisions. And finally, proper documentation is essential to monitor interactions and ensure accountability. These five principles should collectively guide the behavior and actions of member companies promoting an ethical and responsible environment. Now I will give the floor to Pablo, who will present more specifically the key elements of the code that follow and respect these fundamental principles. 
Thanks, Mirella. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Um, moving on. Um, as the title of the section uh, already indicates, I'm not going to cover every single aspect of the code. Um, there are about uh, another half of elements, I would say at least, that um, are not covered in this presentation, uh, but that obviously are uh, probably uh, maybe not equally important, but um, still very relevant. Um, I wanted to start with the general criteria for events um, because they work almost as, a, as an underlying um, set of rules that apply to many different aspects of the, of the code. Uh, at the end of the day, a lot of interactions that companies have with ACPs um, uh, fall under the scope of, of what we call events. And uh, as we will see in, in, in a moment, um, events need to comply with these uh, criteria regardless of uh, if they are organized by, by you as a company or by, um, by a third party. Um, now, these elements uh, that you can see on the screen are normally for third party organized events, at least they are um, assessed by the conference vetting system, as you know. <clears throat> but this doesn't mean that they don't apply also to company events, meaning that uh, that assessment that CVS does, um, you normally have to do for, for company organized ones. Um, I'm not going to go too much into detail. You can find uh, the explanation of these criteria in the code and uh, even in the conference fitting system platform. Um, but just to just to let you know that um, the the basic principles of these of these criteria are quite based on common sense, if that makes sense. Um, for example, uh, regarding geographic uh, location and venue, um, we are talking about the, the specific city in which uh, the event happens. So for example, it cannot be a city known for, uh, for, uh, for, for, for being a ski resort uh, while being organized during the ski season, or it cannot be known as a summer resort while it's summer. Um, the venue needs to be a, a professional setting and conductive for scientific exchanges, which means, for example, that hotels with, um, with uh, casino facilities, for example, or with golf or within a golf course, a golf course are not really, uh, really conductive for, for that. And even if it was, the, the prevalent feeling would be that of, uh, of, a, of an entertainment venue. In terms of guests, and I know that the um, the trend on this point has changed over the last couple of decades. Um, but back in the day, it was very uh, very common to have guests of ACPs attend or not attend, but come to the um, to the venue and to the accommodation setting with the ACP. Um, that's probably no longer the case, but it's still a useful reminder that it's still not okay, and guests cannot be a part of the of the event. Uh, there are some parts, some social parts that um, can be attended by guests, but uh, one needs to be very careful about, about this point. Then uh, in terms of, uh, yeah, uh, hospita hospitality and hospitality, not hospitality, hospitality, um, this refers to both uh, meals and to accommodation. Um, it just needs to be commensurate. It, it, it cannot be luxury, neither the the, the, the accommodation, uh, but also the the meals. And in this point, you also need to keep in mind local uh, local uh, rules, local limits. These obviously um, apply normally to ACPs um, uh, registered and practicing in, in in that specific jurisdiction. But uh, be careful; it, it may also apply to. Uh, ACPs visiting it, rules are complicated. Um, in terms of travel, um, here it mainly refers to the the span of time that can be covered, and it normally needs to be tailored to the to the event. There needs to be a really really good reason for uh, travel arrangements to be made uh, that would uh, go beyond the, the the duration of the event. Um, Again, I don't want to, to 
spend too much time here, but um, please keep in mind that these things I just uh, very briefly covered are more developed in, 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 in the code and in other guidance documents, and please uh, check that out. Moving on to the focus of this presentation of this training, uh, which is how to support or how can ACPs be supported to attend the different types of events. Um, as you could see in the video before 2015, uh, it was the norm in our industry, and it is still the norm in other industries, that uh, companies would approach or company representatives would, would approach ACPs, individual identifiable ACPs, and um, select them to be sent to, uh, to, a, to an event. Um, they would also cover, or you would also cover the um, expenses, the travel expenses, accommodation expenses, um, hospitality in general, uh, but also the conference registration and also the travel. Um, since, uh, well, not literally 2015, there was a one year um, uh, transition period. So uh, I think it was January 2017, if I'm not mistaken. Um, this changed. Uh, companies were no longer able to do that for third party organized events. And uh, the new system or the system towards every interaction would shift was the educational grants system. Uh, educational grants obviously existed before, but they were mainly used for supporting in general an event. Uh, so for example, to, to, yeah, to cover for uh, certain educational uh, sessions or for the speakers, etc. Now the idea was and is to cover also the attendance of ACPs, passive attendance to the event. Um, and in these educational grants, you cover also what you normally would cover um, would have covered directly. So uh, trans uh, trans <laughs> transportation, accommodation, hospitality, etc. Um, now, the main change here, and uh, this is, again, the focus of this training, is that you, as a company, cannot know who you are supporting. And that's the, that's the principle. That's the uh, bedrock of the new system. There is um, a Chinese wall between you as a company and the ACP that benefits from your funds for education. The idea is that if you're funding education, if you're funding medical education, you're doing it in an altruistic way. Um, you, you, you do not have any expectation of return for that funding. And uh, to some extent, there is absolutely no need for you to know who, who, are you, who you are supporting. Uh, there is an asterisk, uh, an asterisk there. In some countries, you need to know uh, because you need to do some reporting or even some uh, prior um, authorization. In those cases, there is an exception, and, and you, 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 you can receive the names of those ACPs you're supporting for the specific purpose of complying with those laws and regulations. And I'm, I'm looking at you, France. But uh, other than that, uh, it's not really, it's not really uh, a complicated principle. You, you shouldn't seek to identify the ACPs that benefit from your funding. And just for the avoidance of doubt, this also includes, um, uh, for example, communicating informally with the uh, manager of this educational grant, for example, the PCO or, or the society, communicating which ACPs it would be great that benefited from the grant. That's not okay. That's just completely going against the, um, the letter and the spirit of the, of the rule. And it's essentially equivalent as doing uh, direct sponsorship. So uh, this workaround or this backdoor uh, system is, is, really, is really completely against the, the rules anyway. Um, moving on, uh, because we're gonna go into more specific uh, details uh, as to how this is uh, done. This is a summary uh, and I will go through each specific type of event, but this is a summary of what is allowed and what isn't allowed in each type of event. You can find this table in Annex 6 of the code. Um, it is quite handy. Um, if you have any question, please don't hesitate to ask it. Uh, I see there are some 
Uh, I think Aline is taking care of that. Um, <clears throat> but um, yeah, I'm not gonna not gonna stop in this table because again, we're gonna go over all of these points later. But just as um uh, as a word of of, of clarification, uh, you can see in green there's two types of green uh, allowed and allowed through a consulting agreement. It, there is a quite big difference there. Um, when that happens, when the consulting agreement is involved, it is because the the ACP is providing some sort of service to the to the company. Otherwise, it's just passive attendance. Move the next. Um, sorry, I have yeah. Um, so this is a general um, the general requirements uh, table. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the conference vetting system approval is needed for. Uh, any kind of third-party organized educational event, including uh, procedure trainings. Um, the difference between third-party organized educational conferences and procedure trainings, in practice, it's in practice is the, the the type of education that is provided in third-party organized procedure trainings. We're talking about hands-on uh, training uh, to a very reduced and specific set of ACPs that uh, work on that specific field in that specific um, hospital or group of hospitals. So uh, in practice, everyone knows who will be taking that uh, training and uh, going through the whole indirect sponsorship process would be um, essentially overkill considering that you would know anyway who would be going to that training. That's That's why there is this difference in, 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 in the prohibition or allowance of the direct sponsorship of ACPs. Uh, otherwise, the same criteria applies. Um, moving on, for, uh, for company events, as I mentioned again uh, at the beginning, uh, the, um, the criteria are common for company events and for third-party organized events. So even if CVS is not involved in assessing whether your selection for a venue is compliant or not, the exact same principles apply, the exact same criteria apply. As a matter of fact, I would even go as far as saying that if you see an event in CVS that was assessed non-compliant and because of, because of a specific thing, and, and, and the CVS normally says that, uh, for example, if it was not compliant because of the, of the venue, um, then you should not feel free to use that venue uh, for company organized events, um, if that makes if that makes sense, uh, the same criteria applies, and um, we would need to be coherent in that sense. Um, so yeah, CVS is not required for these types of events, but um, a big difference here is that for um, for educational events and for product and, and procedure training, you can directly invite ACPs to your events, to your company events. Uh, when they are again related to product training and and, and uh, medical education, um, this is in part or in, in big part because we as an industry have uh, an ethical and in some cases a legal um, re uh, requirement or or obligation to provide uh, training and education on our products uh, for the safe use of of, of our products. And obviously, you you need to you need to make sure that the right people are trained uh, the right way. Um, and then the the, uh, the exception to these is a specific is, is strictly sales and promotional uh, meetings. For example, um, yeah, if you're if you're doing a sales uh, a sales a, a product presentation, for example, that is not it's not okay to to do to invite directly. ACPs or individual ACPs to that event, uh, meaning with invitation, I mean uh, paying for their for their travel, for their accommodation. Obviously, you can send them an email, uh, inviting them to come on their own expense. Um, but uh, yeah, you you wouldn't be able to cover any of the expenses. Uh, there is one exception to the exception, uh, which is the demonstration of non-portable equipment when when you are making. Um, yeah, uh, a presentation or a demonstration or a, or a small show of non-portable equipment. Uh, just 
because of practicalities, you are allowed to 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 bring doctors to your um, manufacturing plant or to your or to a hospital where they are functioning, for example. Uh, this is relatively common, so that that is still okay, uh, but it's strictly for non-portable equipment. Um, going back to the table that that I showed at the beginning. Uh, this table covers basically what I just explained in a more visual way. I think um, you can again find it in the annex of the of the code. Uh, the third column or about taking place within the context of third party organized um, educational events. Bear in mind that we have this was clarified originally in a Q and A. We have moved that Q and A into the text of the code. Um, now it's an integral part of uh, of chapter three, uh, I'm not mistaken, and uh, chapter two. Sorry, and uh, you can find it. You can find it there. Uh, it it was probably one of the most complex issues that we had to deal with uh, in the first couple of years of the code. Um, so I'm quite glad that it basically got um, promoted. To the to the actual code or, uh, text of the code. Now you can find it. You can find it there. Um, moving on, and there was a question about uh, fellowships. Uh, fellowships are types of of uh, educational grants. So um, basically, the same rules for educational grants that you see in the in, the, in this uh, second to last column apply to to fellowship and and scholarships for that matter. Um, as an educational grant. Um, the rules are to some extent similar, but there's a couple of big differences. Um, so you cannot provide them to ACPs. Uh, they have to be provided to, uh, to legal entities. In the case of educational grants and research grants, you can provide them to ACOs, meaning as Mirella mentioned before, meaning um, hospital, uh, hospitals, societies, et cetera. In the case of uh, donations, you can't actually do it unless the ACO itself qual qualifies as a charitable organization or a, or a non-for-profit uh, entity, like an NGO, for example. But um, just to be to be to be clear, um, if you need to provide, or if you can only provide a charitable donation to to a hospital in case of uh, of, of extreme financial hardship and just being underfunded does not constitute financial hardship, just to be completely clear on that point. Um, it needs to be a one-off uh, catastrophe, for example. In this case, we're thinking, for example, uh, about nat natural disasters, um, pandemics, for example. Um, those are the, the extreme cases where uh, providing providing a donation of equipment, for example, or, of, or a monetary donation could be acceptable uh, for for ACOs. And all of them require an independent decision making or review process uh, for the assessment of of the um, of the request. Um, a, a one big difference here, and uh, I think there is a bit of a or there was a bit of a misconception about what restricted basis means, uh, because the, um, the ACOs and, and ACPs to some extent have a, a complete opposite, for some reason, a complete opposite understanding of what restricted um, means. With, uh, with what we mean with restricted basis is that you cannot have or can have uh, any control about the use of the funds. Um, for example, with a charitable donation, you cannot have any any control. Meaning, you cannot say, "Okay, I'm I'm providing you with this amount of money, but it needs to be used for the purchase of um, of uh, hospital beds." And just by coincidence, I make hospital beds. Um, that is not okay. That cannot be done. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the educational grants, including fellowships and scholarships, as well as research grants, need to have a clause explaining what the funds can be used for. They cannot be used just for anything. You, you cannot provide an educational grant to a society uh, for just overhead, for example, or for uh, buying new computers. No, you, you cannot do that. It needs to be specifically for, for educational 
um, purposes. And ideally, you would explain or you would uh, indicate a bit uh, more in detail what those educational uses could be. And the same for the research grant, just not the educational part. Obviously, the, the, the research grant uh, needs to contain, uh, the, the agreement needs to contain some clauses and some provisions about the, 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 the expected use of the funds, which obviously need to be related uh, to, the, to, the, um, to the research program. Um, so that's that's one big difference. Um, one of the principles of the code is um, is uh, documentation, and as pretty much anything, uh, you are not only encouraged but in this case required to keep uh, to keep um, the agreements and, and maybe even in some cases any related uh, communication documented, so that you can refer back to it if if there are questions. When, especially when we are talking about um, donations, it, this can be extremely sensitive in some cases. So yeah, um, you you do want, on top of being required, you do want to keep uh, everything everything documented in case someone comes knocking on your door. Uh, so you have uh, uh, an explanation for why you provided those funds those funds to a potential client. That this is the rationale. Um, finally. You may or may not know, depending on what you do in your company, that educational grants are um, publicly disclosed in our platform, uh, Transparent MedTech, transparentmedtech.eu. Uh, you can go now if you want and check it. Uh, we released the data for last year, just like a month ago, so it's quite recent. But we only we only disclose educational grants, including. Uh, fellowships, uh, scholarships, and uh, grants for uh, public awareness campaigns. So that's the only thing we 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 disclose. Uh, if you're familiar with the pharma system, they disclose much more uh, information than we do. So not not donations and not uh, research grants. Which research uh, research grants? I'm I, I am pretty sure pharma does disclose. Um, well, as I was just uh, as I was just uh, saying. These are the types of educational grants. This is a non-exhaustive uh, list, by the way. The code does provide some rules for fellowships, um, for scholarships, and, and for public awareness campaigns. But there may be other types of educational grants. So uh, please, I think that's the most important point in, in this slide. The list is not exhaustive. Um, in terms of how we originally envisioned the process of um, requesting, approving, and, and uh, executing an educational grant agreement. This is more or less the, um, the infographic. <laughs> Obviously, as with all infographics, there will be nuances and, and, and parts that may not happen in some cases uh, and additional phases that may exist in some other cases. But um, this is more or less the summary uh, of also including roles and responsibilities of the ACO and, and the company. Um, basically, it needs to start ideally from an application by an ACO. Then uh, it can sometimes be initiated by the company, but uh, ideally this will not happen uh, because it can be seen as uh, the company um, not forcing themselves upon the ACO, but tempting or um, yeah, not forcing. I, I, I don't want to put it in the wrong light. Um, but it's better if the educational grant, educational grant is assessed on the basis of a need by the ACO and to not sort of create that need by the company. Um, so the ACO identifies an educational need, it contacts a company uh, with, a, with a proposal or with a request. The company then reviews this request in, independently from, from sales. They can be involved to some extent in the process, but they cannot have uh, other deciding like sales functions within uh, within a company. Shouldn't have a deciding power in this in this assessment process. Then the the contract is signed. Uh, the ACO executes or or basically performs the um, the the tasks or what the grant was provided for, and the company provides the funds. 
that's before the event uh, or during the event. And then after the event, the ideally the ACO would send a confirmation of the uh, of the task. So basically, yes, we we did organize this event or we did um, bring twenty ACPs to the event. And here is the some some proof, some, some documentation, some receipts, uh, etc. Um, and the company may need to disclose the the, um, the 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 educational grant in our platform or in other national platform. There are four or five at the moment uh, countries with national systems um, where you would potentially need to to um, disclose the the educational grant instead of transparentmedtech.eu. Um, and then one element that is quite important and maybe overlooked in some cases, uh, it's extremely and heavily recommended that in your educational grant contract, you include a clause that would allow you to maybe not audit the use of the funds, but at least verify that the funds were used for what you wanted them to be used for educational purposes. Again, this is important for um, documentation processes, but also to be able to reconcile uh, your, your story with what actually happened in case someone comes uh, asking uh, why did you provide a grant worth uh, 20,000 euros to this specific hospital which uh, half a year later uh, granted you a contract for half a million euros this this does happen uh, and you want to have a very very watertight explanation for that um so yeah it's we we really do recommend extremely extremely heavily that you include this uh, this verification clause in your contracts and that you make use of it <laughs> obviously uh, you don't need to maybe use it every single time uh, ideally yes if you can but if you can't for practical reasons uh, maybe do create an internal process to to assess when and where you would do this uh, so yeah important important point uh, this is pretty much the same the same process, but just in a more linear li linear way. Uh, maybe this is a bit um, easier to read for some people. It also includes a bit more information on some on some of the points, but it's essentially what I just uh, what I what I just des described. Um, I'm not sure if this is available in the in the resources area of. Uh, ethical medtech which is by the way the platform that includes uh, all of our materials on the code and there's videos there's training slides there are um, model educational grant templates uh, there is really a lot of information a lot of uh, very good uh, resources there i i would really recommend you check it out it's uh, it's in, in uh, ethical medtech.eu um, and then in the resources area, uh, it's a really, really comprehensive page. Uh, I'm sure you can find this uh, infographic there. Uh, if not, we can make sure that it's there at some point. Um, these are the, the requirements for educational grants. Um, again, <laughs> this includes uh, fellowships and just to, to address that question we had before, um, they are, uh, disclosed, as we've discussed many times at this point, they cannot be provided to, provided to individual ACPs. This is an important point, and this also includes um, the the funds cannot be transferred to an individual ACPs uh, banking account. Uh, just to be clear, even if the ACP is signing on behalf or on the name of uh, an entity, uh, you you need to be a bit careful with where you send the funds. Again. This comes back to uh, what happens if you start getting questions afterwards, and that would really not look uh, good. You need to document and, and keep track of, of the obviously of the agreement, but maybe also of some uh, of some conversations, some discussions that you've had, verifications, etc. Uh, independent review process. Uh, you have to indicate what the purpose of the educational grant is for um and then yeah uh, for the last two part uh, for the last two types of educational grants the neither cvs nor compliance with the general criteria for events apply um but it's important to 
to keep in mind that for any kind of of, of educational grant supporting uh, third party organized educational events, you need to comply with uh, with uh, the, the general criteria and with uh, CDS if you are supporting an event. But when the when the event is obviously when the event is in the scope of CVS, uh, sorry, just an important point there. As you know, CVS does not assess every single every single event. Um, they don't, for example, assess national events, uh, and you would still need to apply the general criteria for events for that. And now moving on to roles and responsibilities. Yes, that would be me. Um, so we thought that it would be interesting very, very briefly to just describe who are the different stakeholders that are responsible for compliance, both within Medtech Europe and then also uh, within the different uh, member companies. Um, so maybe you can go to the next slide, Pablo. Um, Maybe before I go into the specifics here, I think that the point really is that everyone has a role to play in maintaining compliance. Um, but when you go to how we do it at MedTech Europe, there are probably two bodies that are worth mentioning. The first one is the code committee. And this group basically, helps in the interpretation and the application of the code. So whether it's a member company uh, that has a question or a national association, if there are specific questions that have not yet been discussed um, within MedTech Europe uh, and the secretariat, that means us, don't know the answer, we would defer to the code committee and ask them that question. And the code committee would typically say, okay, this is a very specific question. This is the answer to that question to that individual. Or they may actually say, okay, this is really a question of principle. This is not discussed within the code. And therefore we should potentially develop guidance on that. And that's why in some of the answers that I made in the chat, I actually said, this has not yet been discussed. That's an interesting question. Please write us an email and we'll pick that up with the code committee. And the code committee will then discuss whether there is a need to actually have a formal guidance document or Q&A, or if it's just like uh, one answer to the individual that has replied to the question. So the code committee is really an important body within our own governance. And then maybe to go to Ahua's question, how do we ensure that the rules are actually uh, complied with? I mean, the, the way it works is, um, if there is a member company that you believe has is not playing by the rules, you need to, or you, you, you have the choice, and it's really the choice of every single individual to file a complaint with our independent compliance panel. Uh, and um, obviously, I think what is important to mention here is that there needs to be proof. Um, but if you are aware of an alleged infringement, you can submit that question to us and we will, you know, and if you ask us to, to that this is filed as a formal complaint, then we will file that with the compliance panel and then the whole procedure, which is also described in the code, would kick in. Uh, and if, for example, the panel would think that there is or would find that there would there is an actual infringement, then there is a range of sanction that uh, they could decide on. Uh, they can even recommend, I mean, let's say that it's a serious and repetitive infringement, they could even come to the conclusion to make a recommendation to the Medicare board to say, okay, this member should be excluded. So there are ways, but we don't audit our companies. So it is really up to the companies to come to us or to individuals to come to us to actually make the complaint. And um, to be fully transparent, I think it's important to know that a number of cases that we see the, com the complaints are typically not even going to the compliance panel. It is very often something which is, um, is, is, is in informally uh, settled, either because the company against whom the complaint was made is I I investigating internally what has happened and are fixing the issue and when they confirm that to us and the other company, then very often the issue goes away. 
Um, but if the issue doesn't go away, then we definitely would invite everyone to set, to to come to us and to actually consider whether you want to file a formal a formal complaint via the compliance panel. So that's one thing, and then maybe uh, Pablo, if you can go to the to the next slide. Um, this is like almost the, the last slide. I think that um, today we reviewed the raison d'être and the principles of the code. Um, and those principles should really guide behavior across the industry. That there are many rules that are similar to the code, uh, to the MetaCube code. There are many national codes. And then you have your own company codes as well as your company's policies and procedures. And all this needs to be fitting together. But I think the point here, and that's why we really wanted to go back to the basics, the, the raison d'être and the principles across all those documents and for all their many differences, the one element that we would like to get across today is that it is our collective responsibility to uphold compliance principles and those principles across the board are always the same. Uh, and then for the nitty gritty, uh, we can we can discuss them, but they shouldn't be the 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 the, the main issue at least from a principal perspective. So that's my last uh, point for roles and responsibilities. We also wanted to make sure if you go to the next slide, um, there are so it is more about additional resources and 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 references. We have a lot of materials that is that that are available. We have more videos. We have specific guidance on on on, on a training material for distributors. We have in different languages, and all these documents are available in different places. In particular, the Metech Europe website, the Member Share Point, as well as the Ethical Metech web, uh, website. If you click on resources, uh, you will find a lot of those resources as well. And so maybe with that, um, I we we really at the exact end of the of, of time, one minute to go. Um, we wanted to make sure that there, you know, that uh, we also take care of the Q and A's that you have. Um, we will continue even at the end of the call to reply to some of the of the questions uh, that we didn't have the time to reply to. Uh, online. If you have any specific other issues, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Pablo, can you show our email addresses that are in the, the slide afterwards? And, and the next one. So here is how to contact us. We're there really to, to support you. If you have any other question, happy to help. Um, so yes, with that, I would like to thank everyone for joining. And as mentioned, we'll continue to reply to some of the questions um, in the next couple of minutes. And then, yeah, we're there for you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, just starting with the questions, um, I don't know if you, I guess you cannot read um, the, the Q&A, but the first one we have to answer is uh, an, anonym, uh, an anonymous attendee asking, can you give guidance on a business dinner after the third party event with a speaker? Um, now, for example, I mean, there, there's two elements here. There's the element of uh, the actual business dinner, which is fine. Uh, maybe let's start with that. Business dinners, you, you can obviously invite uh, ACPs, whether or not they are speakers, actually. You can invite them for a business uh, dinner. Um, th th that's fine, okay, provided that the dinner complies with the criteria on, on hospitality. Uh, so it cannot be, for example, a Michelin star uh, restaurant, etc. cetera. Um, the second aspect to take into consideration is local limits. Uh, please bear in mind that they apply, <laughs> uh, uh, simply speaking. So you, you, need to, you need to keep that in mind. Um, alongside limits, you also have, in some cases, uh, France, again, again, looking at you, you have disclosure requirements. So if you, you may need to disclose this business dinner with them. So keep that in mind. Um, yeah. Uh, and then what do you mean with after the third party uh, event? If you, for example, are extending the stay of uh, an ACP to have a business lunch or a business dinner 
two days after the event, then that can, that can begin to be a bit problematic. Um, yeah, for example, if you're, yeah, basically that, if, if you're covering for the accommodation uh, of an ACP that is a speaker for you, uh, just to keep that person in the city for a couple of days and having that dinner later, then that, that may still uh, be a bit problematic. But in general, business dinners or business lunches are fine. Uh, what we what are not okay are uh, entertainment uh, dinners or entertainment uh, lunches, meaning just inviting an ACP for the sake of it. Uh, if you're discussing business or if you're discussing educational aspects of your product or, or whatever, but business related, uh, then it will be fine. Uh, in case of educational grants, how exactly can we control the use of the funds? Can you please provide some examples? Um, normally, uh, normally you would ask for some some documentation. Uh, in some cases, for example, um, you may you may need to see in order to actually ver verify the use of the funds. You may need to use. You may, sorry, you may need to see the names of the ACPs that benefited from your grant. And that is okay, provided it doesn't happen uh, on a regular basis and that it happens after the event and, and that you don't use that information, for example, to, to maybe try to contact them and get something in return for your support. Uh, that's just a quite obvious point, but I thought I would make it. Um, but yeah, you may, for example, get the from the ACO that organized the event or that received the grant, you may get the participation uh, list with the, with the signatures of the, of the people. The, the, you may see this, the certificate of attendance. Uh, you may see receipts of accommodation. You may, there's a number of things you can request and that you can see. And again, if it's for auditing purposes, you can see the names of, of the ACPs that benefited from the grants. You cannot do it uh, systematically, but you, you, can, you can do it. Uh, another one. Is there any wording we can use when we have to decline supporting a non We have some language in the code. But it's not in the code that would allow you, if you wanted, to support some informal networks of ACPs. For example, if they are organizing a small event in their hospital, um, used to not stifle this kind of, of educational, very valuable educational events. Um, but if you don't want to, then uh, I'm, I'm afraid you may, it may be a bit difficult to blame it on the code because of what I just said. Uh, but you can always say that it's, internal, uh, it's an internal policy uh, from your finance department. I'm, I'm actually sure that for many companies, this is, this is literally the case, that uh, they would not they would not release funds uh, for entities that are not registered, that don't have a VAT number. So maybe you, you can use that. And if, if you don't have that rule, maybe you want to ask your finance department to, to have it so you can use that line. I, I don't know, I'm, I'm joking. Uh, but this would not surprise me if, it would not surprise me if it was the case. So I guess you can, you can use the finance or the, yeah, the accountancy angle. Uh, what is the position of conference centers that are in football stadiums? Many of these places have excellent conferencing facilities that can cater for large uh, congresses. If there are no fixtures, is it acceptable for industry to support a third-party event when the organizers have selected such location? Uh, to be honest, this is something that is currently being discussed. Uh, it has been discussed uh, in the past by the code committee, and, and essentially the, the, the answer was better avoid it. <laughs> um, the issue is that you're right. Um, in some cases, football stadiums are actually, or any kind of uh, sports stadiums, are actually really, um, really comfortable and well-prepared venues. And if we're talking about a weekday when when there is no football, well, in, in the in the UK you do have football on, on during the weekdays, but elsewhere in Europe normally you don't. So those places are just big, uh, big facilities, big buildings empty buildings, uh, you could potentially do it. Uh, the problem with that is that while, for example, um, a random, I, I don't want to make anyone angry, uh, any football supporter angry, but so a random stadium that is not known in the, in the football 
seen uh, would maybe be okay for that, then it would be difficult to set a bar for more iconic stadiums. So for example, uh, it may not be, it, it may not be okay to organize an event, I don't know, in Wembley or in the Stade de France, uh, even if there is no game ongoing because they are iconic stadiums that are in themselves an entertainment uh, facility. Just just visiting them is, is, is entertainment. Uh, so there's a difficult line to be drawn. Uh, so the code committee has in the past, and I think currently uh, veered toward considering them not ideal locations for, for events. So for now, that's where we are. Uh, but again, we are discussing these uh, literally these days <laughs> at, at, uh, within the code committee. Uh, and so there may be news on this front. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Um, but I do understand what this uh, anonymous attendee is asking. Um, I, I hope that made sense. Um, is it possible to have a satellite symposium by a medical device company which organized the actual scientific congress? Yes. I mean, you're talking about the company event on top of a company event. So that's fine. Yeah. It's, it, it would probably just be considered the same company event. So yeah, it, 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 that's not an issue. Um, it would be okay in any case. I, I'm, I'm trying to think of scenarios where that would not be okay. It would be even okay if you're organizing a satellite symposium in, a, in, a, in, a, in the context of a company organized by another company, I guess. I, I don't know if that would actually happen in practice, in practice, but the code would not prevent that from happening. Um, um, this question about certain educational uh, medical education event providers offer the pre-purchase of vouchers for a 100% discount for attendance or membership. May these types of vouchers be donated with educational grants instead of funds since their use is theoretically restricted to only a specific event? I, it's, a bit, it's a bit of a complex setup, but I guess provided you don't know who receives it. So for example, if you're donating those vouchers to a hospital, then I guess that's fine. Provided you don't know or you don't indicate who will receive the vouchers. Yeah, I, I, think, I guess that's okay. Um, I, I don't see why not. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it would be okay. Um, I'm, 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 I'm just thinking about it for the first time. Um, but yeah, I don't see why not. Yeah. I hope that made uh, sense. But um, Clement, if you want to discuss this further, we can we can just maybe give us a call and we can maybe discuss it. But from the top of my head, I don't see why not. Uh, another question. Uh, you mentioned in the code invitation to dinners during a third party uh, chapter three hospital. Uh, the text says, a uh, small number of participants. Could, could you provide more insight on this? What are the limits? Small amount. No, no. I'm sorry. We can't provide more specific um, language on that. Um, certain parts of the code are left to a certain extent vague uh, because what a number that may make sense in some contexts may not make any sense in others. If that makes sense. Um, so the idea is that, that you would not invite the entire or a substantive portion of the attendance to your dinner, because uh, as I was mentioning before with, with business dinners, um, there needs to be a rational for that dinner. You cannot just invite people for the sake of it. Uh, there needs to be either some educational content, content being provider, provided, or there needs to be some business uh, or yeah, sales um, topics being discussed. And for that to happen, you cannot have 300 people, uh, or theoretically, you cannot have 300 people in the room. There needs to be some, some room for actual discussions. Um, that's the rationale. So no, I'm sorry, we cannot, uh, we cannot give you specific numbers. Uh, that would not work. Um, but that was the rationale. So with that in mind, maybe you can uh, think how that would apply to the type of events that you deal with. Um, yeah, uh, so, sorry, it's not a very good answer, I know, uh, but that's the one we have. Um, 
Could a company support the registration fees of a poster presenter to a third party event if the um, ACI, healthcare investigator, I don't know, requests it and provides us, no, healthcare institution requests it and provides us uh, the name of the ACP presenter. We don't request the ACP name. So, sorry, I'm, I'm going to stop there. Uh, the answer is no, um, not directly. Poster presenters are considered attendees. Uh, so you need to either um, either support their attendance through an educational grant like you would to any other attendant, or, and there is a catch here, you can do it through the research grant. Um, if they are presenting a poster on uh, some type of research where you were involved, either as the um, initiator or as, or as the supporter, and you can include in the research agreement a clause that would uh, allow you to cover for the di dissemination of the results, which could include presenting them in, in uh, third-party educational events. And for that purpose, you could cover the attendance of the ACP. Um, and again, in this case, you normally know who is going to, to go uh, because the research team is small and maybe two people are involved and the two of them go, I don't know. Uh, so in those cases, yes, you will know uh, who who benefits from the funds, but there's no way around it. And uh, otherwise the, the alternative would be to not allow any kind of support. Uh, so yeah, um, those are the two options. I'm sorry that I know that for companies involved in supporting poster presenters uh, attendance to, to third party events, this is a difficult, and sensitive topic is, is not ideal. We know that there's no, there was no better way to address this basically. Um, so yeah, we're involved, make sure to include this clause in, in the research agreement and then you will be mostly fine. Um, yeah. Uh, pharma trade associations are still accepting direct sponsorship. Any effort done by Medtech to align with pharma on this point? Can we expect it to happen in the near future? So we are not going to align, to align with pharma. We, we diverge from pharma. In that sense, um, there is absolutely no talk about going back to, di uh, to direct sp sponsorship. Um, I don't see that happening. I don't see that happening uh, right now uh, or in the future. I mean, uh, I, I don't, I think from everything we've heard in the last eight years, with all the effort that we've, and the companies especially, uh, they have put into making this work, uh, there is, I don't think there's any way that they would go back to pharma. Now, whether whether pharma will consider that, um, I we also haven't heard anything indicating that they will do it in the short term. Uh, it's their decision. It's a business model that is quite different from ours, to be honest. Uh, so what makes sense for us, uh, for the medical technology industry, may not make sense for pharma. It's not for me to judge. Um, it's just, yeah, it's a different association, different sector, and different business model. Um, and if they do decide to do it, I guess companies will be, will be very happy about it, because for, for our common members, they will be very happy. Um, but yeah, that's for them to decide. Sorry, I, I don't want to get too much into it. Um, can a company grant and or sponsorship of a third party event? What can a company can a company grant or sponsorship of a third party event be specifically remarked for a dinner or lunch? Um, I think you would be okay if. So the answer is yes. I guess you could. Well, huh. I think I think an educational grant, no, because I don't see how you could argue that the buffet is an educational feature. Uh, but for the for the sponsorship, sure, why not? I, I don't see why not. Yeah, um, I, I think you normally for the educational grant you would normally provide it as general support for the for the event with. Um, understanding that at least some parts of it may go to to a small part would go to overhead a small part uh, potentially would go for the for the to pay for the lunch uh, yeah 
I think there, there's that understand, uh, understanding, but there's also the, the, understanding, the, the, the understanding that the majority of it will go for educational purposes. Otherwise, it would not be an educational grant. It would just be uh, donation, I guess. I don't know. Um, but yeah, the educational aspect of educational grants is, is key here. Uh, but for sponsorships, yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually sure that that exists. I, I'm pretty sure that some, um, in some events, you can sponsor the, the dinner and the lunch. Yeah. Uh, for the Congress types of, for the Congress type of activities, is it possible to include such activities within a scope? Of fun agreement with the condition that the AC case all wait, sorry, for the so to include such activities within the scope of an agreement with the condition that the I, I, so I'm sorry, I don't understand this question. Um, sorry, I don't know. Um, can we offer an educational grant? Uh, to ACOs in return for the services provided within the context of our reference site? agreements. Uh, in other words, can we support the participation of selected ACPs by the ACO who is the same as the reference site in return for... I Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I also don't understand this setup, but from the little I understand, I would say no, because educational grants cannot be provided in return for anything. Um, you're supposed to provide them altruistically, just because you believe that um, there is an educational need that needs to be covered and you want to support that. Uh, it, they shouldn't be provided in return for anything at all. So without understanding the whole setup, I would say no. But it could be something else. I mean, it wouldn't be an educational grant. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, exactly. But, but uh, for example, True. in specific tenders, yeah. the hospitals actually may ask for yeah. specific educational support. So it's not an edu So I guess what we're saying is, the, the setup is possible, but you wouldn't call it an education grant could, because could be possible. Could be possible. Yes. Um, yeah, indeed, indeed. Um, we were very specific to what we consider educational grants. Um, so yeah, that's why we're making this uh, strict boundary. Uh, are donations in material equipment allowed? Uh, uh, yes. I mean, if the if the donation is compliant with the code, like. The, 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 the whole setup that we discussed before, then the fact that you're providing an in-kind donation is not in itself uh, an issue with the code. Now, uh, legally speaking, that is a very, very sensitive topic. So if you're considering doing this, uh, please just check with your legal department um, because they will want to, they will want to know. Um, the code allows it, but in many cases, this is extremely, extremely restricted. Uh, that's that's the official answer. So be very careful. Um, the next question is: Many struggle with this one. Can uh, you can consider just notifying ACP superior and management? Thanks. Uh, do you mean we issue a letter confirming the engagement which we provided to the ACP to give to them? So it's about the, the transparency principle because I replied to a question. Uh, someone who was saying, yeah, it's very difficult to get the HCP that you yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, get into an agreement with to provide services to actually do the notification, etc. And so um, it is indeed a discussion that has been going on for years, how to make it work. Yeah, yeah. I think the, the default, and I think in some some associations, if I'm some, some national associations, if memory doesn't fail me, even have a, a template letter for the uh, for the employer. Um, so you just normally would send this email or this letter to the to the email address that you have or that the ACP provides. Uh, if you go down the risky route, which is to put on the ACP the burden of notifying their superior, knowing as was just discussed, that it's very likely that that notification will never ever happen. Um, then yeah, you're just you're just uh, trusting the ACP to do it, and uh, that's not something we recommend at all. Because again, they will likely not do it. Um, maybe not with a malicious intent. Huh? I'm, I'm, I'm not implying anything, but the fact remains they will likely not do it. And then there have been cases in the past where. Um, 
the authorities were auditing these these relationships and the fact that the employer the the, the employer didn't know uh even though the company put it in a contract that the ACP was responsible for doing that ended up being actually uh held against the company so do it at your own risk basically uh, otherwise just just sending an email to the to the employer is already considered sufficient you don't you don't even need to get an acknowledgement of receipt, although obviously for documentation purposes this would be ideal. Um, but yeah, the, it, it, it's, it's something that indeed companies struggle with. Would it be possible to type in this chat the question? The questions Pablo is addressing, I seem to not see them. Um, sorry, I, we we're not used to working with Zoom. I I, I thought that com that you could see the the questions. No, they can see the questions, but once it's answered, ah. then they disappear. Ah, okay, that's silly. Um, um, I, 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 I don't. I mean, I. Yeah, so the, the people have to actually go in the question answer yeah. function of, of Zoom, and then you see the questions. But indeed, yeah. once the, the 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 question is answered, then yeah. it goes away. And hopefully, the recording yeah, exactly. will actually keep track of those. I mean, that yeah. the Q and A. Uh, is actually open. Yes, indeed. Um, let's cross fingers. Yeah. Um, can we provide products to an ACO to evaluate the products? Uh, so, yes. The ACO would provide useful insight to improve or better market the product. Uh, ACO would not get a financial compensation, although would have the benefit of use. Yes. So, yes, there's. this is part of the... This is part of the areas of the code that I did not cover, but there is a whole section on uh, of on demonstration products, um, and even uh, there's other types of uh, placing of products for the purposes of of uh, evaluating them by hospitals or, and, and by other ACOs. I would recommend you check the, both the research um, chapter of the code. Um, which may not be what you had in mind with this, with this question, but it's another type of of evaluation. And there is also a chapter on on uh, evaluation products and samples as well. Uh, there's some difference there, as you can imagine. But uh, just just check that chapter; it's quite self-explanatory. So, but the answer is yes, you can. Um, there were some cases that we waited so long to get it checked and approved. Thanks. You, I guess you, you, you're talking about CVS. Um, we know. Uh, I think what you, what, what we would ask you to kindly understand is that uh, the CVS team, um, they they review thousands of events a year. Um, so in some, and and they don't come always. <laughs> nicely spread throughout the year um so there's periods where uh, indeed they they have they are they're overwhelmed by by submissions uh, so we really ask you to be understanding of, of that situation it's a it's a small team it's a very small team um and they, and they do their, their absolute best to to try to deliver assessments as, as soon as possible but in some cases it may not be as speedy as, as you would uh, want but please know that they do their best and also we are working uh to change the platform so that we can automatize some of the things so it would go quicker yeah. uh but that's really working progress and there is many elements of that puzzle that uh, needs to happen so uh probably before early next year that new platform would not be uh in place yet and with that i think we managed to Answer all the questions. Yes, with one and a, exactly one and a half hours. Okay. So, thank you, everyone. Thank Don't hesitate you. to come back to us. And uh, yes, yeah, we here for you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.